Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. 2014 in the USA marks the 50th anniversary of many civil rights movement struggles. Lots of people are asking about the lessons we can bring from that era to this one. But not so many are asking that question of and about the white community. Mab Segrist is a writer, activist, professor, and the author of several books. She grew up during the civil rights movement in Alabama. And she's written about and against white supremacy, patriarchy, and homophobia her entire life. Her influential and crucial autobiography, Memoir of a Race Traitor, continues to inspire me, not to mention a new generation of activists. I'm hugely happy my friend Mab Segrist ag agreed to come back on the show. Thanks for coming in. Glad to be here. Let's start at the very beginning, Mab. I know this story, but not everybody out there does. You grew up in Alabama at the height of the civil rights movement, what did you say? Well, uh, it wasn't just Alabama. It was Tuskegee, Alabama, Macon County. So there's particular local cultures in terms of race and civil rights. And um, Tuskegee was the home of Tuskegee Institute, um, which, uh, and it had the largest, when I was growing up, proportion of black people of any county in the United States, 85 to 89% there. And it was a white minor minority, as across the South, that controlled like 10, 10 to 15 percent controlled 85 percent. And, and do you remember how you made sense of that as a kid? It didn't occur to me very much until it started occurring to everybody. I mean, <laughs> until the civil rights movement literally came to town, and not only came to town, but came to our front yard. I mean, I think I had been fairly complacent. I knew certain kinds of things. I had had conversations with my mother, but in 1963, um, schools desegregated in Alabama, the first four public schools desegregated. So it was my high school, I was in the ninth grade, I got up ready to go to school, knowing we we're going to be integrated, and my dad came and said, I'm not going to go to school because George Wallace had sent a hundred state troopers, some of them on horses, to close down the school. George Wallace, the yeah. governor of Alabama, right. who in his inauguration address talked about segregation, pitched directly right. to the segregationists, right. and, and his famous phrase was segregation now, right. segregation tomorrow segregation forever. Right. Yeah. So, so troopers to your front yard. Yeah, not only, well the, the media were in our front yard. We were two doors down from the school. The troopers were surrounding the school, so we were all surrounding the troopers and I was kind of under the bushes looking out at everything. And um, it was quite incredible and all of a sudden everything stopped. I mean, everybody in the town had been really gearing up since August to make integration work. Yeah. I mean, surprisingly, given all the re resistances that happened later, the Board of Education had put things into place, their student council, I'd gone to student council meetings, and we had plans to kind of segregate the social activities, but we we're going to just try to make it work. When that happened, though, Wallace really put a kind of wrench into the works, and um, in the next week, there was a whole set of moves and counter moves by him and um, Fred Gray, who was an African-American lawyer who had brought the suit in the first place. And uh, they went in to get a federal restraining order and then Wallace threatened to bring out the National Guard and then the federal judge, Frank Johnson, um, threatened to nationalize the National Guard. So within a week, 13 black students came to the school, but white students by then had pretty much been mm. uh, discouraged. You mentioned that your family weren't on the uh the desegregation right. side of things. Right. They were actually, you have a personal connection to right. one of the killings of that year. Right, right. The killing was t three years later, but 63 to 66 really is um, kind of a portal for Tuskegee and certainly for me in, in these 50 year commemorations. And uh, it turned out in that week of interregnum that Wallace stopped everything, that four parents got together uh, and decided to go to Wallace and to start a segregated private school, which was the first in Alabama because Tuskegee was the first public school to desegregate in Alabama. So uh, by the time school had opened, there was a movement of white parents to start what turned out to be Macon Academy, Macon Academy which I went to. I was quite surprised that my mother had done it. Surprised that they'd sent you to the school? To well, the that they school? started the school. I mean, they didn't just send me to it, they started it, you know. So. It was quite confusing, but it was for me this moment of uh, kind of emancipation in terms of consciousness uh, to see how much force could be marshaled to stand between children and to realize that there was something profoundly wrong with the kind of white supremacist mindset that was behind all of this. I mean, I had never seen it played out quite so vigorously. And how did this experience 
whether you were sitting behind the couch mm -hmm. listening or not, shape who you've become. In terms of 50th anniversaries, in 1966, Sammy Young, who was one of the SNCC leaders in town, was shot and killed at a gas station, uh, having asked the white station attendant to go to a white bathroom, and he was sent around the door to the back, and he protested, and there was an altercation, and he ran, and uh, the station attendant had a rifle and shot him back of the head and killed him. And his name was Marvin Segrist. He was a cousin of mine, distant cousin. I never met him, but the I shooter. do remember. Yeah, I do remember the phone call though that night where my dad had gotten a call from the jail and came in and said Marvin Segrist had shot Sammy Young. I didn't know who either Marvin Segrist or Sammy Young was there. There were demonstrations in town. Um, Segrist, who said he had done it, he was standing with a rifle, was indicted later, was acquitted by an all-white jury in the next county, which didn't have any black people on the voting rolls. And uh, it was the end of tactical nonviolence. SNCC came out three days later uh, in, against the war in Vietnam, which was the first civil rights organization to do that. And uh, there was an upsurge in black voter registration, especially from the county, and a shift towards black power, which is what SNCC and uh, Sammy Young and those folks had been much more involved in, so that in the liberal regime, the white sheriff had been good to appoint one black deputy, but then soon after that they elected the first black sheriff in the South. So, so those, that window, you know, really in terms of these 50-year anniversaries and the one that's coming up, um, frame my in intensest memories of that time. And you, your growth out of that? <laughs> Just it terrified me, actually. I mean, the more I thought about it, the more I saw um, in my family and outside of it, um, the more I just felt like I have to get away. I didn't realize until later when I went to Duke to graduate school in the 70s and then came out as a lesbian that there was a sense of, like, I can't live here. You know, this sense of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I came out, though, very soon it was a very vibrant and political lesbian community in Durham, and they were doing all kinds of activism. So I started doing feminist and anti-racist activism very soon there. And then that allowed me to go back and pick up the experiences from my childhood and make more sense of them than I'd been able to make. You made beautiful sense of those experiences in your book, Memoir of a Race Traitor. And I encourage anybody who's, who's listening to MAP now to, to pick up the book um, and, and read it through. But there are a couple of things that you address in the book that I'd like to just pick out. One is white guilt. Mm -hmm. um, Looking at your story, a lot of people might say, how did you ever get the chutzpah up to go back and work in the black community, let alone work against white supremacy? Uh, what did you do with your s own sense of personal and family responsibility? And is it personal, the guilt? Right. Well, I mean, you just do a structural analysis. You know, I mean, what's happened in the South? What was the history of slavery? What's happening in the economy? Why are all these people being, in the 80s, being white people being pulled into Klan movements? What's happened with the economy that way? What's the history of struggle? How do we relate to this? What are other, who are other white people who have been in the struggle before? I mean, it's, it's, it's subjective, but it's never just personal. And it's, we're embedded in our families that way, and we all this kind of stuff around subjectivity. So, uh, and I did a critique of like a history of on being white and other lies. I took the genealogy that my mother had left to me to be in the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the Colonial Dames, <laughs> Daughters of the American Revolution, so that I had white ancestors back to like 1609 in Jamestown. And so I just followed them up and told a story of white settler colonialism and what happened to white people in those struggles. And by the time I was able to recognize it, some of the things that were impacting my own family from having fought in racist wars and been in racist structures and stuff like that. I mean, I just, in some visceral way, recognized this kind of profound damage to my parents and our family structures that went back to gen generations uh, that felt like, to me, increasingly had a lot to do with race. So it was like, how do white people understand race doesn't just stop here, but we're we're constituted by it, which was kind of the field of whiteness, all this whiteness stuff, which was coming along in the 80s, too. So. Now, there's been some criticism of whiteness studies mm -hmm. in that it suggests yeah. to some that whites are somehow the victims. Mm -hmm. That's not what you're no, saying, no, obviously. No, no, no. It just, whites are not neutral in it, right? No, this is not reverse discrimination at all. But it's the kind of racist position is that whites are neutral and look out at all those people of color who have various pathologies that we are <laughs> working so hard or have these cultures that are so kind of exotic and colorful. Mm -hmm. We're just, you know, but we're not in the picture. So after 
generations, if not centuries, of black people saying white people need to kind of attend to your own histories, then that was that way, it, it was that effort to kind of trace the hit, history of white, emergence of white identities in the context of white settler colonialism and um, just to de-essentialize it in mm -hmm. a way. But also, I think the other part of my book that that folks have appreciated is also a record of activism. And this is not just like, oh, well, my identity. It's like, because of this identity, within this identity, for various reasons, I'm like doing this kind of activism and I'm, I'm documenting it. What does it feel like to be a white person, a lesbian with my family history, who's like doing lots of work across North Carolina for six years? So in, in terms of the 50 year anniversary mm -hmm. and the issues that were up for debate that were being fought over at that point, which was, among other things, economic self-determination, political representation, access to public goods, and mobility through the society, you can add mm -hmm. to the list. Mm -hmm. um, what's happened? Well, we haven't broken that paradigm yet, clearly. And it's a very Southern paradigm that has national and I think global repercussions. The paradigm of white supremacy or one group supremacy mm -hmm. in power? Mm -hmm and how it's manipulated and held in place. You know, I mean, racist violence in 1966, Sammy Young is shot, killed. Uh, Trayvon Martin, two years ago, with stand your ground laws in 26 states, it says, if you're afraid of them, shoot them. <laughs> you know, if you need to defend yourself because you're afraid, then shoot them, and that's defense in court. And most Which of was the, the argument states. most of the right. Klan leaders made while yeah. I was under yeah. threat. Right. right, and what Marvin Siegers made after he shot Sammy Young and got off for that. Or lack of access to public resources and public goods, which has always been brutal in the kind of slave and post-slave South. And now with the, the states, 23 states, I think, 20, some, somewhere in the 20s, have turned down Medicaid from the Affordable Care Act. The Medicaid expansion. Yeah, and 10 of them are in the southern states, but almost 80% of the people who are being denied insurance from the Affordable Care Act are in the South because those legislatures are turning their way and there's higher concentrations of poor people, many of whom are people of color. If it's stand your ground, if it's the Medicaid refusal, if it's super majorities, if it's kind of Republican uh, ideology and organizing that's in such a contest in the rest of the country. Um, there's a Southern base to that and the ideology is very recognizable from a history of a slave and a post-slave culture. You know, you can look at it too from the Southwest and you can see the conquest of Mexico and. 1848, you can see what happened to indigenous people. You can, you know, you can read all of those things, but they're still there in our DNA. We have not broken that at all. So those kind of battles, they're very familiar battles. We have records of them and there's new strategies too. Talk about some of those new strategies. Are we hearing the same language used today as was used 50 years ago or has it gone in for an update? Are we seeing I think there's definitely an update. I mean, the two of the organizations in the South friends are working on that I'm most excited about is Project South for the Elimination of Poverty and Genocide and Southerners on New Ground or SONG. And Project South came out of the movements of the 60s with SNCC folks at the helms of them and have been doing very um, wonderful organizing for 50 years now. Um, with new leadership now, a younger leadership that's been passed on, they helped to uh, host the first U.S. Social Forum in Atlanta after Katrina and really focused on Katrina and the diaspora there and organizing response to it, which really shook Southern organizers and people realized there was a whole different level <laughs> when the state abandons you at that level, not only in New Orleans, but all the way across. How do you, what do you do? What's more self-sufficiency? What's more, what's more interdependence in communities? And how can you hold states accountable and when are you not able to, you know? And so? And then Southerners on New Ground formed in probably 1992 or 93. I was one of the six founders, so I'm very <laughs> proud here. Um, Southern lesbians, black and white, who had been working both within lesbian gay movements on broader issues of equality and within those broader movements on questions of sexism, sex, sexuality, homophobia. So um, right now, Song is doing really brilliant organizing across the Southeast, very queer, very, very multi-issue, very networked into a range of organizations where it's not single issue anymore, it's not identity based anymore. Liberation in our lifetime, queer liberation in our lifetime. <laughs> kinship, ignite the kinship. I mean, it's very, both of those organizations mm. I'm totally proud of and really inspired by. If you had one message to people who are 
trying to take advantage of this 50th anniversary mm -hmm. to maybe mm -hmm. bone up on history they never mm -hmm. knew or teach mm -hmm. classes they mm -hmm. never taught or read mm -hmm. books they never read mm -hmm. or do things they hadn't mm -hmm. done before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's your message? Be brave. What's that song? That I want to see you be brave. I want to see me be brave. You know, I mean, it's such an amazing, amazing piece of history where so many people together decided to be so brave and that there was something worth more than their lives. Thank you so much for coming in. My name is Dorothy Zellner, and I wear three hats. I'm a board member of Friends of the Janine Freedom Theater in the West Bank, and I'm also a founding member of Jews Say No, which is a small local group on the Upper West Side in Manhattan. And I'm also a volunteer at Jewish Voice for Peace. My civil rights hat is that I was a staff member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, from 1962 to 1967 and then a staff member of the Southern Conference Educational Fund for another five years. I worked with Julian Bond in the communications department, and this meant that we dealt with the press. Uh, we also sent information up to the Justice Department in the early days of the 60s, which the Justice Department ignored, about black people's inability to get registered to vote. Uh, and then I was a recruiter for the Freedom Summer for people to go down south and spent the summer in Greenwood, Mississippi. The SNCC experience altered my whole life. I was lucky enough to actually be in the right place at the right time. I had grown up in a leftist, secular Jewish family and had been brought up uh, actually during the war, World War II, and very, very conscious of the fact that um, what had happened to us as Jews was directly traceable to people standing idly by, which in our social justice tradition, believe it or not, we have one, you would never know now with bombs falling on Gaza, is an injunction you cannot stand idly by while injustice is going on. The justice for black people who lived in this country, justice for the Palestinians, to me, are on a continuum, and they're all beginning to merge into one big struggle, wherever it is. And that struggle is, can the people of the world, the ordinary people, control their lives? Can they be in a position where they will control their lives and have equity, everyday equity. To me, it's, it's one struggle. It's one struggle, the same struggle. Uh, it's not a nationalist struggle. That's what I think has been so dangerous, so damaging to the Jewish community, is that we, not we, a lot of us have become nationalists, Jewish nationalists. And we now supposedly care more about a country. We care about the country and not who we are. There is a rabbinical story, and it's called Why the Stork is Not Kosher. And the stork, it fits all the other criteria for being kosher. For one thing, it cares only about its own. And that means you're not kosher if you care only about your own. And this is the tradition that I am appealing to Jews to restore, that this has been eroded and damaged by this blind, incredibly crazy loyalty to Israel. They have the drones, they have the guns, they have the weapons. There's only one thing that they don't have, and that's us. And we are the main factor. Because whenever us, whoever us is, get together, we can do the most amazing things. That's what the Civil Rights Movement taught me. Well, Mrs. Hamer was an ordinary person. All the people that we met in Mississippi were ordinary people. I am an ordinary person. I am about as far from a hero as you could possibly get. I got into dangerous situations because of the racists who were attacking us. That's what made it dangerous. We didn't make it dangerous. They made it dangerous. Um, if I can do this, anybody could do this.
And what I tell people is you don't realize the incredible power that you have. That's why I tell these young people, I say, I don't care who I'm talking to. If there are 50 people in a room, 50 people actually who decide to do something and do it together can accomplish an amazing amount. People have no idea. But those of us who were in the civil rights movement, we know because we saw. We saw that it was true. And none of us believe that it can't happen again. But why would it not happen? It's happened before, it'll happen again. And I've been speaking for 30 years to classrooms of high school students, middle school students, and I tell them, your history is the only thing you have. What's in your brain is the only thing you have. They can take away your iPhones and your iPads and all your, all your other i devices, and the only thing left is here. So this kind of life is the most productive, and if you, like me, don't believe in a religious hereafter, it's the only way that you can be immortal, that your life, your work can live after you do. Thirty years ago, I read a book whose title seemed to say it all. All the women are white and all the blacks are men, but some of us are brave. The message from the writers was simple. It's time to end the invisibility of black women and all women of color. But 30 years on, so little has changed. I wish someone would send that old book to every news outlet in the country and to the White House. The president's signature program to help black youth is a program that's targeting only men and boys. It's called My Brother's Keeper. What about the sisters? 1,400 women of color asked in a letter to the White House sent earlier this summer. The My Brother's Keeper efforts include recruiting mentors, collecting data, and partnering with private organizations to help boys of color get through school. No one's denying the crisis facing the boys, the women who signed the letter said. But the crises facing women and girls shouldn't shrink to the point of invisibility and get zero attention in messaging, research, and resources from the White House. The same old silos of three decades ago still seem to apply. When he addressed the Working Families Summit, the president talked about women. He made the point that effective family policy is female-centered policy. And yet when the topic switches from families to race, only men come in for special attention. Who do we think is raising those boys anyway? And aren't there girls in those same families, the women asked? Journalism suffers from the same problem of silos. Just take a look at two articles published on the same day in a single paper. One about reporting rape, never mentions race. The other about holding police suspects in jail, never mentions gender. So, is the prosecution of rape ever affected by race? Well, generally, yes. So why leave it out? The study in the policing story looked at a data pool of males and females. The group imprisoned least was also the group that included the most women. So did gender play a role there? We have no idea. Reporting that's inclusive isn't just fairer, it's better. Just like the president's initiative. I had a chance to moderate an online seminar with some of the women of color who wrote to the president. They didn't want less for the boys. They wanted something also for girls and a program that would be smarter and therefore more successful all around for being conscious of the intersecting structural conditions that affect all youth of color. It seems like the penny that just won't drop. You can find a link to the webinar and see a new interview with Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the signatories, at grittv.org. Join our mailing list and write to me, laura at grittv.org. And thank you.